the name of this talk is Woodrow Wilson and the Law of Unintended Consequences. Presidents all think they're the most powerful men in the world. And one of the things that I think hopefully is coming through in these lectures to date is they're not as powerful as they think they are. Um, if you have any doubts, I'd ask George W. Bush. Um, presidents, in fact, find themselves limited in many ways uh, by laws in addition to those that are in the Constitution. And, and the law of unintended consequences is one of them. And I want to talk about that. But let me introduce you to Woodrow Wilson. Um, the joke is an old one. On his death, Woodrow Wilson went straight to heaven, where he encountered Moses on the golden streets of New Jerusalem. You are Mr. Wilson, are you not? asked the great Hebrew leader. I am. Then I'm very sorry for you, said Moses. Why so? Weren't you Woodrow Wilson, President of the United States? I was. And didn't you issue the 14 points for the settlement of the Great War? I did. Well, said Moses, then I'm sorry for you because on earth they have done dreadful things to your 14 points. That's nothing, Wilson shot back. You should see what they've done to your Ten Commandments. <laughs> Eighty years after his death, most, most of us regard our 28th president as a marble statue or a plaster saint, sculpted to the apprehensions that Wilson himself voiced in the election year of 1912. Speaking of his charismatic opponent in that year's presidential contest, the professor turned politician said of Theodore Roosevelt, quote, he appeals to their imagination. I do not. He is a real vivid person whom they have seen and shouted themselves horse over and voted for millions strong. I am a vague, conjectural personality, more made of opinions and academic prepossessions than of human traits and red corpuscles. In fact, there's a wonderful moment on the 1912 campaign when someone in the crowd shouted, hey, Woody. And Wilson, taken aback, said, did you hear that? He called me Woody. Part of Wilson that I think is so elusive and so poignant is a man who wanted to reach out to those people out there who were prepared to call him Woody uh, but he never quite found the way, unlike Teddy Roosevelt, who was Teddy to everyone. Try to imagine yourself in 1912 in Woodrow Wilson's America. It's a very different country from the one we live in today. The United States in 1912 is an adolescent nation of hupmobiles and Norfolk jackets growing its way toward modernity. We just had a 300 millionth person, according to the Census Bureau. The most recent census, the 1910 census, fixed the center of population in this country at Bloomington, Indiana. There were fewer than 100 million Americans. One fourth of them were farmers. Among urban dwellers, only one household in 10 had electricity. Fewer still reported bathtubs, gas coolers, or washing machines. And yet, Americans in 1912 boasted two-thirds of the world's telephones. The city of Chicago alone counted twice as many as Japan. There were more miles of rail track in Texas than in the entire continent of Africa. Versailles was the name of a French palace. Lusitania, a five-year-old passenger liner, celebrated as the winner of the 1907 ribbon for the fastest transatlantic crossing. You have never heard of peace without victory or open covenants openly arrived at. To you and most of your countrymen, Woodrow Wilson is a one-term governor of New Jersey, less notorious than some one-term governors of New Jersey, yet far less familiar to the electorate than his rivals. To know Woodrow Wilson, one must soak in the bath of Southern Presbyterianism and shake hands with a confessed mama's boy who told his fiance in 1884, it isn't pleasant or convenient to have strong passions. I have the uncomfortable feeling that I'm carrying a volcano about with me. To know Wilson, one must penetrate the emotional defenses of an aspiring leader who raised his chilly manner to the level of principle. Plenty of people offer me their friendship, 
he admitted, but partly because I am reserved and shy, and partly because I am fastidious and have narrow, un-Catholic taste in friends, I reject the offer in almost every case. Perhaps it is because when I give it all, I want to give my whole heart and feel that so few want it all or would return measure for measure. Few historical figures better illustrate than Woodrow Wilson the axiom that character is destiny. Introspection was inbred into this minister's son, along with the shorter Westminster Catechism. And he seems never to have questioned why he spent a lifetime racing the clock, why, in his words, success does not flush or elate me except for the moment. What next? Wilson wondered characteristically after receiving the good news that his first book, had been accepted for publication. I must push on. To linger would be fatal. Scholars have despaired of reconciling his intense craving for human affection with his reluctance to share his inner self. I tell you one thing, Bobby, he wrote a friend in 1880, I am absolutely dependent upon sympathy. Then why didn't he show it? Scholars have puzzled over the warm humanity of Wilson's speeches and the icy rectitude that denied his own brother the job of postmaster. What are historians to make of the first Southern-born president since Andrew Jackson, imbued with his native region's courtly manners, family ties, and patriotic attachments, yet feeling himself a nomad, homeless, as he put it to his personal secretary, along with a taste for sweet potatoes, fried chicken and rice, when a more troublesome mark of the South, a racism that cloaked itself in benevolent superiority. As president, Wilson every night polished his own shoes to, serve, to save servants the trouble. At the same time, he instituted segregation throughout the federal workforce. Go figure. It's harder for a leader to be born in a palace, he said, than to be born in a cabin. He left out a third alternative, a manse. Both the side of Wilson that was in love with tradition and the striving, dissatisfied seeker after place can be traced to a household which Irish merriment dueled with Scotch sobriety. To his secretary, Wilson revealed two natures in constant battle for emotional supremacy. Reflecting the diverging streams represented by his father, Joseph Wilson, and his mother, Jessie Woodrow, he observed, on the one side, there is the Irish in me, quick, generous, impulsive, passionate, anxious always to help and to sympathize with those in distress. Then on the other side, there is the Scotch, canny, tenacious, cold, perhaps a little exclusive. I tell you, my dear friend, that when these two fellows get to quarreling among themselves, it's hard to act as umpire between them. Wilson's father was a pulpit orator who recited puns with scriptural authority. Despite a dyslexic condition that prevented him from reading until he was nine years old, young Woodrow grew up a beneficiary of books. The elder Wilson drilled his son in verbal precision. Make your mind like a needle, he commanded, of one eye and a single point. Shoot your words straight at the target. Words were to be Wilson's bridge to other people. Sometimes, unintentionally, they were a barrier. From an early age, he would try to exert control through his 62,000 word vocabulary. Yet if he stayed physically close to home, in imagination he roamed far afield. He took refuge in a dream world, imagining himself Vice Admiral Thomas W. Wilson Duke of Eggleton. He filled scrapbooks with ship pictures, made daily reports to the Admiralty, and fought pirates in the Pacific of his fantasies. An aging black butler hit the mark when he recalled, quote, an old young man who tried to explain the reason of things, more words. At the age of 15, Wilson hung a portrait of William Gladstone, the British Prime Minister, over his desk. He said he was the greatest man who ever lived next to Jesus. Much later, he would pay tribute in Gladstonian terms to what he called the beauty of democracy. You can never tell when a youngster is born what he is going to do with himself, and that no matter what circumstances hamper him at the outset, 
he has got a chance to master the minds and lead the imagination of the whole country.